it's a total honour to chat to Brendan Foster today. He's one of my uh, childhood heroes, somebody who had a, quite an influence on my early days and my decisions I made. And as most people probably know, Brendan is a, a former world record holder, European 5,000 metre champion, Olympic bronze medalist, sports personality of the year, uh, ran his own company up in the northeast, and of course was the founder of the Great North Run. Um, just in case you needed reminding. Brendan, how have you found uh, lockdown? Has it been an experience that you uh, would like to see the back of? <laughs> well, that's a good opening, yeah. Well, basically, everybody's in the same boat, but I'm very lucky. We live out in Stockfield in Northumberland. So I can get out walking and a little bit of running every day, which I'm doing more of. And the, the, working from home is quite, quite novel because you don't have to travel to work every day. So... Um, I'm now the chairman of the company, so I'm less hours involved, but still having to be involved in strategic thinking. So, to be honest with you, even though you can't go anywhere, um, that's a bit of a negative, but the rest of it's not too bad, actually. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. I was just wondering, you know, in terms of a sort of modern day parallel to your running days, I mean, if, if you go sort of back, rewind back to, I suppose, the 1980 Olympics when um, there was obviously a, a call for a boycott in Moscow because uh, uh, Russia uh, invaded Afghanistan. And a lot of the athletes were trying to be talked out of competing by, by the government at the time. And um, obviously, there must have been a lot of uncertainty for, for the athletes on the team. In terms of a modern parallel, I suppose it's the same for these athletes who have been training for years for one goal and, and, and now you know, seen it taken away from them. How did you find the uncertainty, if you can cast your mind back? Well, we, I, was in, I was at the time, it was January of 1980, and I was in New Zealand training with Dave Moorcroft. We were running training together for the Olympics. And the most incredible thing, really, when I look back, I remember it was every day, not sure what we're doing. Are we going to the Olympics? Are we not going to the Olympics? The British government says, don't go. Fortunately, we had strong men in the British Olympic Association and the British Athletics Federation who said, we're going to the Olympics for our athletes. We've been invited. The British Olympic Association has been invited to the Olympics. The government hasn't been invited to the Olympics. So whether the government want to go to the Olympics or not, it doesn't matter because they're not invited. So it's the team that's going to the Olympics. And I remember Dave Moorcroft and I in New Zealand, we used to talk about it when we were training. But actually, because of communications, it took two days to register in the newspaper in New Zealand. So... So if, if I remember, you know, you couldn't even get the Newcastle United football scores until the Tuesday morning. So right. I know when I've spoken to him a lot since, Seb Cole back here in the UK was being antagonised by the government and particularly by Margaret Thatcher. It was because he was top dog then. And they were trying, trying to persuade him not to go to the Olympics. And Seb, Seb took a stand, which, is, which he'll always do, because at the end of the day, you have to try and keep where you can politics outside of sport. And so the uncertainty wasn't a big deal because you still did your training. The, the environment in Moscow was, was not pleasant. But um, at the end of the day, like I said, the British government weren't invited to the Olympics. It was the British Olympic team that were invited to the Olympics. They went. So looking back, that was, that was then and this is now. And this is a bit different because the incredible thing, really, the Olympics we held this year, we have had a set of Olympic champions. When the Olympics are held next year, it wouldn't be the same Olympic champion. So somebody's going to somebody's going to win next year who wouldn't have won this year. Somebody's going to lose next year who would have won this year. So athletes' careers come to a peak. There are some athletes who you can look at now and you think, mm, can he or she hang on to that position? Uh, so it'll be different. But you know, you can't do much about this. This is a this is nature imposing itself on the world, isn't it? It is indeed. Yeah, you've got to be a bit philosophical about it, I suppose. So, Brendan, I sort of wanted to ask you about the Great North Run, of which you are the founder. Now, the Great North Run, if you come from the Northeast, everybody knows about it. Most people have done it. All my friends have done it. All my old school friends, all my family have done it. I wanted to ask you, well, firstly, it's in its 40th year this year. Is it going to happen? Well, at the beginning of the year, we received, we had 60,000 entries, which is the biggest ever mass participation event in the country. The Great North Run has been the biggest running event in a, in a country in its whole history. And we've had record numbers for many, many years in a row. This year was the biggest ever. We made a special effort. We changed a few things. We got 60,000 entries, but we had to reject about another 60,000. So the demand was huge, and we increased the, the junior run, which you may remember, and we increased the junior run to 10,000 kids. 
We have 10,000 children. We have 60,000 adults. We've got all the, all the entries are all in a computer. And we're, we're sitting here now. And if you say, is it going to happen? My only honest answer is we're watching the science. We're, we're doing what the government are doing. Yeah. We don't know. We don't, we don't know. If you, look, if you want to bet on it, you would, you'd want long odds for it happening, wouldn't you? But as of, as of right now, we are waiting, looking at things which are changing every day. Sometimes they're changing for the better. Sometimes they're changing for the worse. But um, the 40th Great North Run will, as Britain's biggest ever mass participation event, will happen. I'm not sure it's going to happen this year. Okay. All right, so you heard it here. <laughs> Not sure. Keep your yeah, keep your eyes on the uh, pulse. All right, Brendan. So I wanted to ask you. I mean, you're obviously retired officially, but somehow I I suspect you still are working behind the scenes and various things. Are are you still involved with various projects? Well, I'm, I'm the chairman of the company that organises the Great North Run. So yeah. as the chairman, I have to take an overview and, and involve myself when I'm needed to be involved and involve myself sometimes when they don't want me involved. But but, um, but that's the way of the world, isn't it? So I'm sitting here contemplating what should happen on the Great North Run, uh, the Manchester Run, 30,000 entries for the Great Manchester Run. Will that happen in the way we've envisaged or not? And the only thing I can say, honestly, is nobody, I don't know, but nobody else knows. Nobody knows what's going to happen to this virus. People don't even know the kids are going to go back to school in a few weeks' time. So I'm not a clairvoyant, but watch this space. But the only thing I'll say to you is we're all looking forward to staging the Great North, the 40th Great North Run as Britain's biggest ever Massive event, a celebration of all those years of, of, of history, really. An event that started off as a fun run through Jarrow and Heaven on the way to South Shields. Now Britain's biggest ever mass participation event, one of the biggest half marathon, the biggest half marathon in the world, one of the biggest running events in the world. Um, it'll come back. It'll come back sometime. Yeah, well, look forward to it. I mean, uh, I think I first did it when I was 13 years old. I don't know if I was supposed to, but couldn't stop a 13-year-old. And uh, I think I got the uh, I got I got a letter through the post saying congratulations, you are the third woman home. <laughs> you must have run in somebody's number, or you might you might have had long hair like that. Eh? <laughs> so now, in, t- in terms of grassroots athletics, which you're you're quite involved in, and I was sort of speaking to uh, a lady who works for uh, Made for Sport the other day, and I know they're they're involved with with the Great North Run, trying to raise some money for charity, and it's being match funded, I think, as well. And you know, we were chatting about sport as um a mechanism for social change and whether or not that power for it to do that could be better harnessed than it has been by the government now i know i don't know how involved you are but i suspect you are involved in in that and what do you, would you like to see in terms of using running or sport as a social change agent well i think i think exercise if it takes if you say sport and you, and you move it from sport to exercise, and you move, and you move it from running to swimming, cycling, walking, working in the gym. If you, if you, if you put the, an, an umbrella on the whole thing and call it physical exercise, then physical exercise has never, has ne- just in the same way that <clears throat> grassroots sport has never had the, has never had the clout to, to gain much recognition, the same as that physical exercise has never been given its rightful place because if you think of, if you think about it you you have to you have to eat to live you have to sleep to live you have to look after your health to live but the most efficient way of looking after your health is to do exercise and exercise has never been on the same level as at the right level in terms of the, the healthy story i mean to be healthy you need to exercise and if you look at the i thought it was a really significant piece and i and it was written in the Sunday Times a few weeks ago by a, a top journalist called Nicholas Helen. And when he spoke to me, he was talking about people running past each other on the, on the towpath around London and Boris's idea about staying at home except to go out for exercise. And I thought when Boris Johnson stood up and said, you need to stay at home except for going out for exercise where you run, walk, or cycle, I think that intervention by Boris Johnson was inadvertently a major step forward because the Prime Minister, having, you know, who's now been struck down by the virus, saying that exercise is important and an essential part of people's life, um, it, I think it, he, he could have more influence with that message than he did with 
getting the whole nation active after the Olympics. The Olympics was about enjoyment and pleasure and joy and celebration of others. The running bit was about Mo Farah and Jessica Ennis and, and Usain Bolt. Whereas exercise for your own healthy life and running for your own healthy life or cycling and running and walking and swimming for your own healthy life is, I think, moving centre stage. And this is the opportunity, this is the time for exercise to become an essential part of everybody's life and be recognised as such people are understanding, you know, particularly in the case of a virus like this. Health and fitness and resilience are three things that need exercise to nurture and need exercise to, to, to maintain. So basically, I think Boris is on the verge of a, that intervention, talking about uh, run, walk, cycle, as part of your healthy lifestyle. I think that is a significant move. Even though it hasn't been recognised yet, because everyone's been busy being locked down, and I thought that was significant, and as such, Nicholas Helen wrote in the Sunday Times, and, and you know, quite a few people were, responded to it, you know, wrote to me about what I'd said, which was that, that Boris's intervention was a significant one. Yeah, okay, it'd be interesting to see how it pans out. I mean, uh, personally speaking, when when I've when I've been at the Totnes, which is uh, a little town uh, ten miles down the road, to do some shopping for my parents, and um, I see people running in the streets who clearly haven't run before because they're they're wearing like jeans in some cases and a t-shirt, and it's great. You know, so I think we probably are in the middle of a sort of a new running boom. I don't think we're in the middle of it. I think we're we're dormant. It's dormant at the moment. Right. Whether it comes to real, whether it comes to life, will be determined. You know, for example, running alone is what has been prescribed. Really, walking yeah. alone, cycling alone, um, has been almost prescribed by the government to say we need you to do that, or you can do that for your own physical and mental health. And I think that's a real step forward. Yeah. Uh, the next bit is running together is a more natural thing. People, it's in our DNA yeah. to run together. You know, it's in our DNA to run, but it's also in our DNA to run together because in, back in prehistory, man used to hunt in packs, literally to eat, to run, to catch things, to eat, to live. So, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of, there may be a little bit of goodness comes out of this horrible pandemic. And, yeah. then, and in the case of um, running, Running is probably more people are running now because they they've got a little bit more time and they also they think it's they think it's important that they've been told to go and exercise. Uh, and the next step is running together, which tells me that one day in the not too distant future, the mass events will come back and be and be strong again, even more demand for them probably because if you learn to run alone and start to enjoy it, then the bigger enjoyment is going and doing it in groups and doing it in packs and doing it in numbers and doing it together. Yeah, I hope so, Brendan. I really hope so. I mean, so, uh, you know, talking talking about that, um, you started out at Gateshead Harriers as a young, I think you were what, 16, you were a teenager anyway when you joined the club, weren't you? And you became, I guess you went away to university, correct me if I'm wrong, came back and then and then you were part of that, that great Gateshead team of the 1970s. Probably we retired uh, in the 80s, weren't you? So how much of that moulded your um, enthusiasm and channeled your, your enthusiasm and your motivation as well? I was very lucky that as, as a schoolboy, I met Stan Long who became my coach. And you, you know Stan, and Stan was very helpful in your running career. But the point right. is, he was, an, he was an evangelist. He, was a, um, he wasn't the most scientific coach the world ever known, but he was the best motivator and the most... And he was an evangelist. He loved to see people running, he genuinely loved that. We learned from Stan when we were 14 or 15 to go just to go out and run, you know, enjoy going out for a run. You know, and he used to say to us, go and run 10 miles on the weekend. 10 miles? We only, we're only supposed to be running a mile in these races, Stan. He said, no, 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 go out and run and enjoy it. Just don't even time it. We didn't have all this gadgetry. Um, and if, the, if, if that gadgetry had been around in Stan's day, first of all, he wouldn't know how to use it. And secondly, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have recommended it. The guys that I trained with became yeah. friends for the rest of my life. You know, and um, the guy that I run, run a lot with, and who was a big advisor to me, Lindsay Dunn, died recently. Um, and Lindsay was a great advocate of running. But, but the thing they had all together was that they all enjoyed running. So in my case, if I hadn't been a good runner, I'd have been a bad runner. You know, so it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to train, I'm going to go to the Olympics. It was like, you train, oh, I'm getting a bit better, I'll do it. Oh, I'm getting a bit better than that. So, it was a natural, and if you didn't end up running the Olympics and breaking world records and stuff, the other guys that I trained with 
didn't break world records and didn't run the Olympics, but they still ran and they still run now. So it was a, it, you know, became a, became running for the sake of running was what we did. It wasn't, we didn't, you know, we didn't have, um, we weren't professionals, we were amateurs. We, yeah. we worked during the week and run at weekends and, um, and, um, and eventually later in my career, you got paid a few quid to do it. But it wasn't, that wasn't why you did it. It didn't, I never ran to pay my mortgage because I wouldn't have enjoyed that. I would have, I would rather work to pay my mortgage than run because I wanted to run. So it, it's completely different. I mean, these guys are professionals. That's their careers. That's their approach is different. And I, and I know people. We had four guys working for us at, at, at the Great Run Company a few years ago. We sat around the table one day and I was talking to them and saying, what, we had a meeting and I said, what have you done this morning? And I'd been out for a run and they four hadn't. All four of them had been international athletes. All four of them had tried to do um, Olympic things and world championship things and world cross country things and had done and represented Great Britain. But I said, and they said, well, no, I'm retired now. I said, well, what are you retired from? Going on for a run, you know? What, what, why do you have to retire from going on for a run? Why don't you retire from running for Great Britain? But retiring from going on for a run is like, I don't understand that. So it, it, is, it is different. It was now a sport. It was a sport you did because you loved it. And it's easy to look back and say they were great days. But if you look at it now and you see Mo Farah and you see what Jessica Ennis and, and Paula Radcliffe did, you know, it's great now. So, so um, no, no, I don't know what the question was, but that's my answer. <laughs> So, I mean, I've been reading Charlie Spedding's, uh, I think it's a book called uh, Last to First, I think it's called. And he talks about his Gateshead days. And and um, I wondered for you, I mean, you've just answered the question about motivation. It seems like your motivation was, was part being part of the group and bettering yourself. But I wonder also if, you know, you felt like coming from that part of the Northeast at that time, which was a time of like pretty poor economic circumstances for most of the country if that was an added incentive uh, to you well that, that's a that's a that's a nice story in the royal the rovers or or alf tupper book but it's not real you know i was um we were brought up in the working class area um we supported the local football team we were we were reasonably good in those days i wasn't good enough to play center for for newcastle united so uh stan long found that i was a good runner and um, i went from there but it was it wasn't, there was no master plan and there was no big scheme. And at the end of the day, like I said, if I hadn't been a good runner, I'd have been a club runner or an average runner or a bad runner. So, it, you know, you didn't set off at the beginning saying, saying, you know, I'm going to be the best. You just set off and said, can I get a bit better? And that was, that was the environment. And our, our running was our social life. We were mates together. We trained together. We raced together. We spent time together. And we still do, you know. So um, just yeah. before he died, Lindsay and I and a couple of others had a had a regular curry, which we often used to, every couple of weeks we'd have a curry. And sometimes they talk about the old days. You know, we had we had five, more than five. We had probably, I don't know, eight or ten guys who run, ran under two hours twenty for a marathon back in the seventies. You know, so they were good runners and they trained hard to get there. And uh, and the thing about it is they all respected one another, even though some were doing great things and Charlie was winning a medal in the Olympics. But the respect for the for the performance, you know, like was always there. Yeah, I think it's um, it's another book I read recently. I think it's um, uh, Great British Marathon Legends. I think it's called, and it it basically interviews some of the great marathon British runners of the nineteen eighties, like you know Hugh Jones. Steve, Steve Jones, um, Charlie Spedding, um, and um, the seven factors it comes up with are: I think it talks about um, having a well-rounded athletic background, having a, a strong peer group influence, and a general sort of endurance subculture. You sort of ticked all those boxes really at that time. But and then the other one was having a sort of a, a, a strong capacity for pushing your body to the to the limits. So I was going to ask you about in terms of your training. What was the evolution? It might not have been a conscious thing at the time, but looking back, how would you say your training evolved so that your workload capacity changed? Well, but basically, I, I, you know, when I first ran for England, I was uh, in the Commonwealth Games in 1970. I was running about 40 or 50 miles a week. And I suddenly thought, well, if I want to last the three rounds of the 1500 metres, I need to be a bit stronger. So we decided to add a bit more mileage and then, and then that worked. So we had a bit more mileage. And then basically it was a balance of how much mileage you could take with how much and not get injured. And I was very fortunate. I rarely got injured. Um, how much mileage could you take, which, which left you not exhausted, but 
but able to run again the next day. And I ended up running 120 miles a week um, as, a, as a peak, um, as a, but I used to take over about 100 miles a week. And that was what worked for me. And I did good quality speed work, but not like, not speed work like sprints, but speed work like repetitions over 800 meters and a, and a mile and two miles. And, and, but it evolved. You see, I wasn't planning when I was running 1970 in the Commonwealth Games. I wasn't planning that, uh, to win the Commonwealth Games at 10,000. I was running 1,500 then. And there wasn't a mass I planned, well, I wouldn't, I'll, I'll get a medal in the 1,500 and then I'll win the 10,000. It was like getting better at 1,500. I thought, mm, not quite well. I was fifth in the Olympics, so I thought that's not quite good enough. So I go a bit further and train a bit more, and so on and so forth. So it was it was a, it was a it was a building block, you know. It was a, a little bit. That's where Stan Long would have his influence would be. You know, take it canny, you know, take it easy, and gradually increase. So my career went from 1970 Commonwealth Games. I retired 1980 Olympics. That was it. And all those years, I I had success at various uh, levels. And I, every year I managed to compete as well as I could, so I was fortunate. And, I, and when I look back on it, it was a, you know, you can look at my career now and say, well, that was the model you used, but I, it was like gradually doing it. You know, it, was, it, was a, it wasn't a monumental change or anything, it evolved. Okay, but I was interested because, I mean, I, I must admit it's years since I read your autobiography, so um, excuse me if I'm a bit hazy on that, but... I don't remember you talking about, you know, going to the gym. Presumably you played other sports. You must have had a sort of fairly balanced sporting background. No, when I started running series, I didn't do any, didn't do any other sports and I still have never been to a gym. Right. When you look at a gym, you look, it looks all scary with all those metal bars and things. So no, I've never been to a gym. And I never, we never did any exercises. We never did core stability and all that kind of stuff. And to be honest with you, it probably would have helped if we had. Yeah. But I always remember Norman Anderson, my coach, um, who was my physio, who was a world-class physio. And I used to say, to him, Norman, do you not think I need to get a bit stronger? And, and so I'm, you know, I've just been watching Ian Stewart. He's really strong. He said, well, Brendan, when the, when the 5,000 metres includes lifting a bar across the line, we'll start weight training. But for the moment, no, it's not needed. But that was, that was a bit ignorant because I've seen more powerlifting weights. And, they, you, know, they, well, you know, we did what we, we did what we could and we did what we did. Um, and yes, it would have been, some of the scientific aids would have been helpful. Because I often used to run when I was stiff. But we didn't have massage, deep massage and all that. So some of those days would have been easier. And, you know, I've always thought, it, never been, I've never done one, but apparently it's having a cold ice bath. Apparently that's good for you. Doesn't it get your legs less stiff? Well, who knows? I'll find that out in, a little, in my next life. Okay. So I find it really interesting, you know, um, coming from, you know, the, the next generation. Looking, looking at you guys, uh, how you trained, you do, did a lot of your running on the tarmac. And this would have been even before, you know, you brought Nike or you were involved in bringing Nike over to the country before proper cushion running shoes were sort of mass marketed. So you would have been wearing fairly basic shoes, I imagine, at the time. I'll tell you what we used to do. We used to, in, the, in the early 70s, we used to run in shoes called Adidas Gazelle shoes. When I was a contracted athlete with Adidas, I used to get a couple of pairs. I used to take them to Bolton's, who were surgical shoe repairers. Yeah, he was at Elsa Carriers. And they used to stick extra bits of rubber on the bottom to give you more cushioning. So we were building our own shoes. To, we were using the Adidas shoes, building cushioning on them, because it... Because in those days, when you ran with those shoes on, your teeth chattered. You know, that was clearly not good for you. And you used to build up these shoes. And, and uh, so, yeah, we were, we were having the... And at the same time, that was when Bill Baum in America was sticking waffles under the Nike shoes to make them adapt. So we weren't as clever as Bill, but we, had, we were doing... The Bolton Brothers surgical bootmakers were, um, were doing well in Newcastle because a lot of us used to do that. I remember Colin Bolton. He was at my club at the time, and I think I've got a pair of his built-up shoes actually, made of cork, cork on the on the soles. I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, just on the theme of your sort of training days, and then you obviously went up through the ranks. Um, you won uh, Olympic medals um, later down the line. How much of your uh, time was spent training abroad, Brendan? I suppose in 1980, I did, I did three months in New Zealand, but basically we trained, at, we trained at home. The air was the same. We didn't do much altitude training because we just dabbled with that a little bit. But no, it was, we trained at home. That was what we did. Okay. 
And if you could tra- change anything now then and, and go back to your, your former days, what would you change? Um, well, that's a good question, actually. What would you change? Well, you'd, um, I'm not sure I ever would have wanted to be a full-time athlete because I think you then that wasn't, probably wasn't for me because, you know, not doing anything and just going out for a run wouldn't have been my style. What would you change? Some of the modern assistance, some of the measurement devices and the Strava things and all that, and some of the physiotherapy and massage, and, um, probably um, overall physical body work. And at the end of the day, all of those things would have just been to try and improve you a little bit. So I'm not sure I want to change anything, frankly. I, I was doing some research for this and I came across Alf Tupper, Tough of the Track, and it, it had your name next to it. So I was wondering, wondering, did you co-author that one of the later versions of that book? <laughs> I, I think they did a. They were in touch with me once, um, some kind of endorsement or something, saying that you know, because my coach Stan used to talk about Alf Tupper because when he was when he was growing up just after the war, the the, mag, the comic magazines and Alf Tupper was a comic magazine, and he was the he was the the, the rough lad from the north who used to go down to London to the White City and beat the toffs. From, from Oxford and Cambridge. So that was a kind of a, that was part of Stan's um, fabric of, of thinking was you go down to London and, 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 and beat them in London. And it was a little bit of a, no, it was, it was fairy tale stuff, really. And rounded it off with uh, fish and chips. That was yeah. a staple diet. Well, that, that can work sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah. Um, they should bring it back as a podcast. <laughs> Narrated by Brendan Foster, Alf Tupper. I don't know what a, I don't know what a podcast is actually. Oh, oh you do now. This, this, this is a, this is a podcast, yeah. This is a podcast, yeah. Uh, Brendan Foster's first podcast. I, I don't know what it means. I don't know what that means, but yeah, <laughs> you'll find out soon enough. So, uh, just looking ahead, if you if you were to get involved with you know young runners t- today, I don't I don't think you do any coaching. I don't think you've got time for it. What would be your sort of words of wisdom to them i think the thing that bothers me at the moment when i see there's there's a little bit too much attention given to to running and timing themselves all the time you know i I only time how long i've been i've never i never know and i never knew then how we used to go for a run never knew what pace we were running at never knew how far we were running we used to run for an hour and that was it and i think there's a little bit too much attention given to the measurements of details but at the end of the day the only thing I would say is be like, it's like Stan, Stan told me, just to go out for a run and enjoy it. And, and don't be frightened to, to run five miles or, or more than five miles, but just getting to enjoy running, I think, was the, was the key. And I think you've got to be a bit careful that kids don't get too um, result-oriented at a too young an age because the, the big kid always beats the little kid when he's, when he's 12. Yeah. Um, but the little kid can meet the big kid when they're when they're twenty one. Yeah, that's that's very good good wisdom. I mean, I, I remember you know growing up in Newcastle in the nineteen seventies and eighties, and I I'd, I'd never met you, but I'd, I'd obviously heard about you. And and then there was along came Steve Cram, along came you know Mike McLeod was around your time. He was at my club. Um, you know, uh, Kevin Foster, Charlie Spedding. It was quite hard not to be sort of sucked into the the sort of romance of it all. But I remember even then, like thinking, "All right, uh, what do what do I have to do in training to to be like that?" And there was, you know, there's quite an onus on results. I think it's quite good to to keep it balanced for as long as you possibly can. And and Stan, who you know was obviously you know my coach when I was a junior, was such a great motivator. He wouldn't be results orientated. He'd give you a Emil Zadapek video, take it home. You get it home, and and it was like you know horizontal stripes across the screen because it was not very good quality. But you got you got the enthusiasm and, and the passion from from those videos and from Stan. I mean, if you look at the sport now, there's two ways of looking at it if you look at one you could make a speech on a on a rush at a, at a, on a stage and you could say the sport of running has never been healthier or you could come on the stage on a different angle and say the sport of athletics has never been worse and and the combination that you know there are more people running more more awareness of running more more events to take part in in a in a, in a non-track and field sense and then if you look at track and field it's it's well tabulated how um, uh, uh, what a rocky road that's going through but at the end of the day the, the pure thing that comes out of it is 
is the running the running thing. The running thing is is an individual pursuit. It's for you to take part in. It's for you to take part in on your terms. Be as good as you want to be. Doesn't have to win anything to be as good as you want to be. I mean, when I was about eighteen, I used to go. I worked for Procter and Gamble for a year before I went to university, and I used to go off to the national cross country and I'd come back, get in the in the lab on a Monday morning, the bloke say, how, "How did you get on?" And I'd say, "I was tenth, tenth. Oh my God!" So nine of them in front of you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many was in the race? And he'd say four hundred. He said, "Oh, well, that's not too bad." Nowadays, if you go to work with the after the Great North Run and you finish fifteen thousand in the run, and you run two hours and forty minutes, people are going to say, "Oh, that's good. Well done." So I think what we did do, we've democratised that sort of um, performance. So it's your own individual performance that matters, not not whether you finish eight or fifteen thousand. And that's big progress. So I think that. The running bit's healthy, always will be. Man will always run. Man will always pursue great things, but also pursue your own ambitions. Um, I would love to run a marathon in two and a half hours now, but I couldn't. So I can't have that dream anymore. So the point, the point of the matter is there's always there's something there for you. And, and the challenge of doing it regularly, getting that feeling of doing it regularly, still available for all your life. Do you still run at all, Brendan? Yeah, I run the... I would run, I'd run and walk more now. If you run all the way, you get too nagged. Whereas if you run and then, because it's very hilly where I live, if I walk up the hills and run on the top, it makes it a more pleasurable experience. So, so um, yeah, I've invented a new sport, running and walking. It's called yomping, isn't it, in the army? Um, Brendan, thank you so much for your time. Um, I don't want to keep you too long. So, um, you know, I could, I could definitely ask you a shed loads more questions, but um, I'm not going to. Um, thank you very much for sharing your time no, no, with me. No, pleasure. And uh, for me, this is like uh, it's a bit of a childhood ambition fulfilled to get to talk to Brendan Foster. So, thank you. Cheers. Good, good to see you. Hope, good, hope this goes all right for you. Take care.